Now it's recording, so we will get back to the slides. You can see my slides, right? Presentation, right? Uh, right. In the in the chat is the etherpad, so please uh, you can join. Welcome to the, the meeting. Uh, please be aware that this meeting is aligned with the notepad. The meeting materials, uh, the etherpad. Uh, this is the link. Please join the slide set adding to the materials and we are as well in the Java room and please follow the for minute takers and sign the blue sheet that is the uh, This is the agenda for today. So we're going to go through the working group status, uh, what's going to happen with role in the ITF 109, the progress of the RPCs via Pascal, then the updates and capabilities by Raul, and then we are going to discuss about this uh, Ripple version 2 topics. Milestones, uh, we update the, the milestone for both Richard and working groups are close to la next year, and of course we probably have to update the rest. Yes. yes. If, if that was the agenda bashing, I would like to, to bash the agenda, if it's okay. Uh, yeah. I would like to, to to see if we can steal a little bit of time from the Ripple V2 topic to give it to me um, yes. for the PDAO because a lot of things happen on the PDAO and I would like to steal like 20 yeah. to 30 minutes on this okay. map. No problem. We can. So maybe we can pick some of them from turn on and such rather just if you don't mind. This is no problem. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, about the milestones, okay, we probably have to update the some dates. Uh, we have updated the projected milestone. So about the state of the active internet draft, how they be ripple? Uh, it's still in progress. We got a new version, but still some issues have to be handled there. Probably we have a new version, the prediction we are going to discuss today. This modification is a start, it's a work in progress. NPDO is in the RPC RQ, and our priority was a new version. And we are looking for reviews. Uh, for more places where we have a new version. Then the extension is a, the Shepard document is in progress, triple observation uh, active. Turn off is an ISG evaluation. We uh, have the update today is unaware leave as well. This are triple info we updated and uh, I have to update the diff documents and then when I update it we can ship uh, to Alvaro to continue the process but I, I need to complete this tip. And then the two technologies is active, uh, last in the information. Was presented last time. Yes. Can you maybe try to speak close up the mic to overcome ah. the noise? We know you have some noise issues but uh, Carsten saying can't hear you. Okay. Can you try to speak a bit over the noise? Um, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, so I let the information was presented in the last interim meeting and now it's expired. Um, we have open tickets in the GitHub about this. Uh, this uh, DAO projection issues as well, these tickets are we presented today. And uh, some other issues are in the track side. Uh, we have uh, the do a survey uh, to know what the community think about meeting into the ITF 109. So from this result, uh, people most of the people like to have a meeting. Then. Uh, the time slot will be one slot, but uh, 120 minutes. And we will have a meeting in December. These are the additional comments and suggestions. If we have in December, it should be after 8 December. And of course, we can talk on, on during the ITF about the Ripple version of the topic. So uh, by, based on the survey, we will request a meeting before Friday to have a one of 120 minutes. Is that okay for you? Is that okay for you? Okay. No it's objection. No objection. <laughs> okay, we continue. Um, 
with the Pascal. Um, so, thank you, Ines. Can you please move one slide? Oh, do you want me to move the slides? Okay, thank you. It's better if you do it. So, um, this this draft has been through um, pretty much all of the ESG review by now, um, but we have two two discusses pretty much on the same subject by Martin and by Ben, and uh, the discusses are about the mode of operation. Uh, you know that we define that for MOP seven. Uh, we would use, basically we would use the uh, MOP extension and that would be a repo v2 and we'll discuss that a lot today. Uh, but it was very hard to to say that correctly in a draft because uh, for in the one hand uh, we appear to be changing RFC 6550 repo because repo never said that uh, there is a time bomb in uh, how long the, the, the flags uh, are available. And so uh, there was nothing that said that for certain maps, those flags would be uh, available and for other maps, the flags would not be defined anymore. So just adding this capability to put a time bomb on the flags, flags seem to be a, a update to our C6550. And uh, then how to express it, whether there was a need to do some changes in Iona, et cetera, that wasn't clear. And it's not just this draft, it's also unaware leaf. And it's it's also use of ripple info, and as you know, use of ripple info uh, is actually the first in line. Uh, it's, it should, and we will see the news today, but it should go back to RFC editor very soon. And uh, basically, it is the one that should be uh, being the first in line that should be updating RFC six five five zero to say that uh, the flags are time bomb, and that the IANA uh, tables should reflect that uh, that is this time bomb. And so what I did in this draft and what I did in uh, unaware draft as well, unaware list as well, is to uh, point on unaware and say, since that update, the, you know, the, the flags are uh, undefined for, uh, are, you sh should not use the flag for a map of, of seven. So obviously when a new implementation will implement a map of seven or a map X, there will be a definition uh, for the flags, but uh, the problem was for an implementation written today. What should it be doing? Well, since we, we don't know what the flags will be for Ripple V2, we just said, hey, you can't use the flag to make a decision, but still you have to code something. So in the particular case of, uh, of uh, turn on RFC 8138, we said that if the map is seven, then on, and I copied the text here because it's very, very specific and please look at it. Basically the implementation must uh, use the compression without checking a flag if uh, the six loop and other compression applies to the link. And otherwise it must not uh, compress. The six loop and does not apply to the link. Obviously. So so that's, that's basically what we reached discussing Alvaro discussing with uh, Michael. So, so we had those calls, and Ines, thank you. And so, so we, we reached that kind of decision. So you will see the same bottom line for uh, use of Ripple Info and for Unaware Leaf, where since the flags are not available, there must be a decision. And so for each of the three drafts, we'll, we'll say, uh, you know, from up seven, what is the, the default behavior? So. We pick the default behavior because we we consider that this is a uh, transition between a mode where you know, the flag is kind of up, off, and a future world where the ca the flag is on. So we decided that in this uh, far away future of uh, MOPEX and Ripple V2, um, the transition would be finished. So we used as default the other side of the, of the transition. So for the, this particular case, compression is on. And that's pretty much shit for this discussion. Oh, we have a message from Raoul. So, how do you want to speak your question or do you want me to? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I hope. Uh, so, 
essentially it means that the turn on draft is uh, going to mandate uh, rpl veto behavior anyways right <coughs> so the turn on draft doesn't speak about rpl veto it just says that mob 7 does we don't know what happens in mob 7 that's what it says so so okay. it says if there is a rpl v2 and we want it to be backward compatible with an implementation that we do today with this draft then ripple v2 has to have rfc 8138 on by default on six loop admins okay, so it's really uh, yeah in the future yeah. You have to live with an implementation that you do today. So you want to know what an implementation of today does. So we specify what an implementation of today does. And this is basically if map equals seven, then eight one three eight is on on a six loop. So in the future, when we write Ripple V2, uh, we will have to mandate eight one three eight in a six loop and links, or will be null compatible with the past. So th there was another question? Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's fine. Thank you. What was the other question? Yeah, I think I'm I'm the one with the other question. Um so th that pretty much what you just explained uh was another question that Martin asked me separately, which is we're assuming here that seven and whatever happens in the future is going to use compression and Concepts use dependent. yes and use whatever um use of rpl yes. info and unaware leaves and um and yes. uh, the other one we which i forgot about right. transitions yeah. right so his question was basically the same thing that you just explained you know what happens if you guys change your mind or what happens if in some extended mop in the future let's call it 10 or you know, I don't know, whatever, um, the working group changes its mind. So my answer to him, and, and just to double check with you, is that you know, at that time, if we ever get to, I don't know, something called MOP10, um, you know, either the nodes that are implementing this specification, the turn on specification that, that don't understand MOP10, but they understand seven and you know, they assume there's seven and something else. We'll they only see seven. Impression. They don't see ten, right? Right. They, they only they see don't... seven. Correct. So from their point of view, they're going to say, "Well, this looks like seven. I'm going to try and use compression yeah. on this link." Uh, yeah. In ten, uh, the working group said, "No, we don't want to use compression anymore for whatever reason." Then the nodes just won't be able to operate there. Right. This node will be non-backward compatible. It will have to be retired from the network. Right. And so what I what I told them is that by that time, what I hope is that this will happen so much in the future that we don't really have to worry about it right now. Right. Now, right. if we improve 8138 and we maintain it backward compatible, then that should be okay. Um, yeah. But yes, yeah, so that's exactly correct. The, 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 at least specifying something gives us that we know if we are backward compatible or not. So as long as we maintain those decisions, we are backward compatible. And the day we change this decision, we know we're not. And then we have to say, uh, those old nodes need to be retired from the network because they, they cannot operate in that network. So, so any other question? Okay, so Ness, if you don't mind, let's move on to the other presentation. So that's unaware leave. <clears throat> so uh, next slide, please. Uh, as opposed to the uh, turn on draft, unaware leave is just entering the uh, IETF last call process. So for now, the, the, the review we had was uh, Alvaro's review as uh, the idea review for, for our own area. So thank you again, Alvaro. I mean, you, 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 you're doing so much for us. But, so I can only say thanks and thanks again. Um, so the discussions that we had were not very much on the operation. It seems that the operation looked okay. It was more like uh, definitions and terms. 
And what is a rule? Is it a host? Is it a plain IPv6 host? But no, because it needs to do this thing. Um, do we define the rule as being a host which can do the things that we, we place as uh, requirements uh, on the host in this draft? And so the, the answer to that is um, two things. First, the rule is already defined. It's defined in use of ripple info. And so it's, it's a, a leaf. And the leaf means a, a, a host attached at the uh, border of a Ripple network. And it's Ripple unaware, meaning that it doesn't speak 6550. And so by this definition, it doesn't mean uh, there can be rules which will not be able to communicate in a Ripple network. There will be. So, so we, want, we, we needed to clarify what additional requirements we add on the rail so that it can effectively operate by this position. So it's it's not creating new standards because the standard is already there, it's at 505, but it's how you use it, what you place in this field, this field, this field. And that 505 was designed for this to happen. So that there was a clear, for instance, flag in the registration saying, hey, I want the router to give me routing services. So it's an abstract flag. It doesn't say it's a, it's for Ripple because the host doesn't know it's Ripple, but the flag says I want routing services. So we, we have a requirement on this draft that this particular interface in 8505 is implemented correctly, meaning that if the, the rule wants us to do Ripple for him, then he has to to set the flag as specified by 8505 for this case. So we, we don't want to change definition of rule. It's, it's a leaf that is a whole attached to a Ripple network and it's Ripple unaware, meaning, okay, it doesn't speak the, the, the RFC for Ripple. But we also have had to explain clearly what the requirements were on the rule so as to, to, to operate with us. So the changes that were needed on this draft was to, to, to be more specific on uh, when we use the term rule to make sure that it reflected the original definition. And there was also a lot of use of 6LN and 6LR. And 6LN and 6LR are uh, defined by for 6 low pen. And we are repo, we are not 6 low pen. So why is it that we have to use that terminology? Well, that's because the other side of the interface, 8505, uses that terminology. And actually, we started reflecting that in uh, use of Ripple Info for the routers, which are at the border of the Ripple network and that serves external destination. We already use the term 6LR. So in our terminology in this draft, I had to explain that by 6LN and 6LR, we meant host and routers, which implement the function defined in 8505 not necessarily anything else, 6 low pad. I mean, they, they, it's just by 6LN, we mean just the 6LN functionality as described in 8505, excluding the rest of 6 low pad. It can be, it can be in, can be out. But for us, for this specification, just means 8505 contribution. So clarify that. So, so now we know what a 6LN is in this document. So there again, we have the, the, the status of the Ripple conf configuration option flag, the DODAC configuration option flag. So we, same resolution, pretty much now, I duplicated completely the text between the two drafts, just changing, you know, what the flags are and what the default value are for those flags. Um, there, there was a final rewording that Alvaro asked me on the drafts. I made it in the GitHub. I'm just waiting for the next opportunity to publish because it's a very minor, I would say functionally speaking, doesn't change anything. So it's just clearer. So I thought let's not just publish plus one for that, unless Alvaro, you want me to. Um, uh, yes, why don't you go ahead, that way I see the oh, final okay. stuff. If, if you want me to publish that, that version as well, okay, I'll do that. So I have to do after this meeting to publish um, the new version of, of both documents just to incorporate that little change. And in this particular draft, so MOP7, uh, since the flag is not there and we're past the transition, the flag meaning uh, the root is capable of proxying the uh, EDAR. So when you see, when you get a DAO at the root, 
the route will do the, the EDA REDAC exchange with the system beyond the health of the host. So we save all the travels throughout the network, uh, which is one of the functions in this graph. Well, we expect that for Ripple V2, the route will must be capable of doing this. So it's on by default. And that's pretty much it. Any question on this draft? <clears throat> Maybe we can move on. Uh, Ines, do you mind? Okay, so um, I left those those drawings. It's not to speak them for, for this or unaware, but they will be useful for the discussion on uh, the what projection because we are also using tunnels and I will explain why probably using those, those drawings. And also last time I was asked to publish them. So I thought, hey, uh, what if I, just keep them in these slides. So if people need them, they will they will know where to find them. Okay, so now we are going to the DAO projection graph. So this is a work in progress in uh, the working group. It's progressing. Um, actually, there were many discussions on many fields. So, so just to, to remind people, this work is not benign. It's not a small piece of work. It's introducing a new routing paradigm into Ripple. It's introducing SDN into Ripple. And so it's kind of normal that to do a, a major addition to Ripple like this, uh, we have to define new formats, new messages, or new options. And uh, it's also normal that we, we kind of hesitate whether we should do it this way or that way, et cetera. And that's when the discussions on the mailing list are so necessary. So I'm trying to trigger discussions on the mailing list and I thank Raoul, Michael, etc. who are helping. Uh, more contribution is always appreciated. So one, one of the, the facts of the draft as it stood uh, in the recent version is it got overly complicated. But the reason for that is you could be operating in a main geodive which was storing mode or non-storing mode and you could build storing mode and non-storing mode routes, uh, peer routes over it, projected routes over it. And actually those projected routes could be injected in the main instance or they could be uh, traffic engineered path that we call truck. So all these created a lot of combination and add to that, what if a, 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 the path between A and B goes over one track and then another track, or if one track is actually encapsulated in another track. All, all those all those things created so many cases and it, it became unmanageable and, and just too much to implement and too, 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 too many cases. So the question was, how can we make things simpler? And so the also there was the case where you have a, a, an instance which has multiple routes and so multiple view that. And so do you want to build a path that goes across? Uh, from one DODAG to the next DODAG uh, across the, the frontier, and then which route would signal that because each route can only talk to talk to the nodes in its own DODAG. So uh, basically, it was getting crazy. So we we had to 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 do some uh, a razor kind of choices and make simplification, like we did for having storing mode and non-storing mode in my repo. We we had to go the same path and, and say. Let's let's get this to complex. So, the first uh, simplifying change that that's proposed is, and actually I wrote it that way. I can I can roll back, but I wrote it that way in the version I published yesterday. That we have only one main instance, so we we don't we we are playing within one main instance. You you don't do peer routes across instances, and you don't even do peer routes across the other. The only question left, and you'll see there are questions at the end, is whether the final hop, the, 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 the node to which we live across this projected route tunnel, uh, is possible that it is actually on the next DODAG and, and still a neighbor to a node in this DODAG. And I tend to say, yes, that we should be able to do so we can continue on the other side. But we would not have hops across DODAGs, even if it's the same instance. So that's the first thing. So one route can actually 
control every node at every hop on this track. That makes things a lot simpler. So second simplification is the main instance itself. Do we want the main instance to be either storing or non-storing? The, the fact is the non-storing is for the most thing the, 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 the mode which is mostly deployed out there. The other thing is we need topological information at the root or at the PC to be able to, to push those PDAOs to, to establish those routes. In non-storing mode, the DODAC is already known by the root. In storing mode, we would have had to add some signaling to tell the root about the DODAC. So saying that the main instance, the main DODAC has to be non-storing makes our life a lot simpler. We don't have to signal the DODAC to the root, he already has it. The only thing that we need to signal is maybe additional siblings or possibilities for route computation at the PC, but it's just advertising more siblings, not the whole structure of the DODAC. So that, that's, that's a huge benefit on stake and non-storing. So basically the second simplifying, simplifying change that's proposed here is to make it so that only uh, non-storing uh, is usable for the main instance. Now, uh, third thing, our main instance now is non-storing. Should we use PDAOs in the main instance and what would that be for? Well, if you remember when pretty much the first use case we, we ever had for PDAO was to say, hey, if this non-storing mode route down the DODAG is long, many, many hops, that means that routing header has many, many entries in it. Even if they are compressed, it's still a lot of, of space in my packet and my frame is, conf is, is constrained. So how can I make it so that instead of doing strict source routing down the DODAG, we do some form of loose source routing down the DODAG? To enable loose source routing, it means that you have a routing state between the loose hops. And that was the first use of PDAO. Before we did those tracks and this traffic engineering and blah, it was, it was initially just to, to, to shortcut um, between the hops in a loose source routing header. And so to do that, uh, if, if, you, if you use a non-storing mode, uh, you reinsert the, the, well, it's not even insert your own caps uh, for the uh, uh, steps that you're skipping, uh, that you're saving. So if you do, do it only once in a network you, or on the path, you, you actually save nothing. Even worse, you're adding more space actually in the frame just to have this, this routing header between those two loose source what, uh, hops. So, so it doesn't, doesn't help really to to use non-storing mode PDAO to complete loose source routing uh, normal DAO. So, so the, the third simplification is to say, hey, when you're in the main DODAG and you just want to add routes to the main DODAG, then the only thing you may want to do is, and you can do, is a storing mode PDAO. So now in the main DODAG, the result is the only possible combination is storing mode PDAO over non-storing mode uh, route, main, main DAG, meaning that it's really meant to enable loose source routing, and that's pretty much it. But you can also do transversal with, with storing mode PDAO. If you really want to, that's possible. But the, 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 the main opportunity there is probably to, to uh, Establish to, to, to shorten the, the, the size of the routing header. If you want to establish transversal path, the idea is to use tracks. So that's the, those T paths, which are separate instances. Each track, as we call it in six dish and, and, and row, is its own local instance. 
actually I clarified that text in, in the, the recent version, but it was already there. So try to rewrite it a little bit more clearly. But when we establish uh, uh, a route or kind of traffic engineering purpose to, to basically shortcut, avoid going through the common parent, blah, um, we use a geodag, which is rooted at the destination, and um, we call that that thing a track. So I I aligned for the last discussion the mailing list. I aligned the, the, the term track with what six station DAO defined. So we have a serial track, which is just a sequence of halves, or we have a complex track, which is like a geodag from a source to destination. Okay, so so that's the um, that's the track thing. Now. There is another simplification that, that we looked at, and now we enter the world where things are not yet very clear. It's how you can avoid loops. And basically the way to create a loop is to have a, 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 a route which is incomplete. I'm, I'm getting a message from, it's a proposal route, right? It's it's um, so so let let's see what Raoul tells us. It, it, it's cool to take the 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 comments as as, as we go. So yeah, so uh, uh, Pascal, uh, you know, I'll let you finish and then come back. You know, I, I just uh, keeping my points ready. So uh, yeah, it's, it's okay. So but it's, I see that it's a major change. Well, it's yes, it's a major. Uh, we eliminate a lot of case. So yes, yeah, it's a major yeah, change. Yeah. So that's why I point you out like so. So, so, so Pascal, uh, so if we, uh, in a way, we are we are reverting back to the version one of this draft, uh, except no. for except for the tar track part and the multi-segment yes. track parts, right? Yeah. So, so we I mean, have version one plus multi-segment tracks in the document. Yes. It's a way of saying it, but it's just for when we manipulate the main instance, mm -hmm. because what we we wanted to do those non-storing projected routes. This, they are completely there, but they they are taken from the local instances of the destination. Mm -hmm. It's it's a lot easier to signal it this way than to try to add those routes to the main instance. And if you add those routes to the main instance, you start creating this risk of doing loops. And this is the one thing we did not want to to create loops in the main instance. So we basically say, hey, um, we we. We do only the, the, the easy game of basically PDAOs uh, along the to shorten the the, the straight uh, source route to make it loose. Now the other thing that we want that we we do here, and that was one of your points earlier, is to avoid loops, right? So the the the, the problem is you have a, a track which doesn't go all the way to the destination, and that is not source routed. Then, as, as you, you, you go through that track, and when you reach the, the end of that track, you, you have to route to, to, to the destination, but the track is finished. So you, how do you do that? If you go through, back through the main uh, geodag, then you might go all the way up to a common parent, and then it would go down, possibly, to the ingress of the track, and now you're in a loop. So the, um, the hop by hop games. The, I'm sorry. The the the, the storing mode uh, projected route games can be very dangerous. It seems kind of easy to create loops with those things if we don't make them strict. Like you give every hop, and you don't provide rules to ensure that when you put them one after the other you don't end up uh, in a loop. And this is the piece where we are not 100% clear still on the document. How do, do we avoid having a peer route and then another peer route and then another peer route? And we create loops. So right now, the draft says, if you use storing mode peer route, then you go strictly, so you put all the hops, uh, so you don't do lose and you go all the way to the destination. If you do that, then you're sure you don't make, uh, you don't create loops. But if you do that, you cannot build complex tracks either because complex tracks will have a sequence of segments. 
So right now, as, as the draft has it, uh, this is too constrained. We, if we want to use storing mode PRA to complex track, then we have to, to make it, we have to allow like taking a packet off a track of, of a segment and put it in the next segment. So, so it, it's, it's kind of non-fully understood and non-fully specified outside. So what is specified right now is a, a storing mode PRR, so a segment is triggered by hop and you cannot take from one segment and put in the next segment, meaning that you cannot do complex tracks with a draft of these terms. Obviously, we are not going to, to let's go with it. We need, or, or we need to accept that, that restriction. Uh, otherwise, we need to figure out how we, we avoid loops. Uh, next change. Well, that's that's what I was just discussing. When you take something off a uh, uh, storing mode, so projected route, you cannot put it in another because if you put them back to back to back to, to get to the final destination, then you may have a loop. Unless we, we specify how we avoid those loops. So the, the, mm, the, the, the bottom line is as, as written right now, you will see text which says when you, when the, 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 the egress of the track takes the packet of the track, so usually it's non-capsulation, so it decapsulates, he has to do a local delivery. At least when it's a, a storing mode PRR. Local delivery meaning either to its own stack or to a neighbor. Oh, but okay. not <clears throat> so so, so, uh, so Pascal, uh, the way I understand this is uh, the egress uh, node. Uh, yeah, so, so you, you you've been very clear. So uh, the egress node has to make the delivery. But how would that decision be made? You know, uh, what I'm trying to say is how would I tell? Uh, I mean. It, it's a data plane operation. How would I tell my stack, which already is there, to make sure that that delivery is done locally? If not, it, it, how on what basis will it not send it back to the root to you know and, and form a loop? Yes. Again? So the, the well, so, so we 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 will have slides for that. Okay. Okay. Sorry. But basically, okay. the packet has every indication uh, that it's for it's being forwarded on the track. Okay, okay, because we right. might we might do a lot more than just following a source route path as we are in the track. There could be dedicated time slots because we are doing determinism. So we need to to know which flow we are in definite terms. And so so for us it's called a track. Okay, and okay. so we need to to specify what track we're in. And so it's it's in the packet. So the egress when it receives the packet, it is the destination of that packet. In any fashion, the egress is the destination of, of the packet, even if there was a source route. Uh, when the source route is completely uh, exhausted, consumed, the, the, the destination in the end is the egress. So the egress gets this packet for local processing. Inside this packet, there might be, inside this encapsulation, there might be a packet to, to a, a, a neighbor. Uh, and that's when the, the features of RUD, etc. can be useful, the one that we just get. But we, we may go back to that. But the bottom line is the track egress will be the, the end of that track. There will be an RPI which has the instance ID, which is the local instance ID identified in, that identifies this track. So based on that information, the, the egress knows it is the egress and it knows uh, which track that is. And so he can he can make the decision as as he is the destination and, and decapsulates, that's when you can make this decision. Um, another simplification that we just discussed, and we, oops, no, back, back please. Yes, it's how we build the PDAO. So initially you could do like DAO, you know, you could have, uh, in a DAO, just to, to, to remind, you can have a number of targets. And then you can have a number of transits. So the target are the final destination, the transits are the parent. Um, so a node it could have multiple addresses, for instance, and put them all as targets. 
and you could have a number of parents and you could put all them as transit and then send that to the route as an example. Or uh, uh, an access router, uh, border router at the edge of the, the report network could have enough uh, children which are uh, unaware leaves. And so he would do uh, the DAO for them. So that would be multiple targets, again, all those rules. And uh, he might indicate himself uh, as parent for all of them. So you've got this concept of factorization, multiple targets, potentially even multiple TIOs. And you could even do that multiple times, sequence of targets and TIOs, and then more targets and more TIOs, et cetera, et cetera. So, so DAO allowed all this complexity. We tried to figure out you know, how it could work having too many things in the same PDAO. And for instance, in storing mode PDAO, the PDAO is forwarded across the reverse path from the egress to the ingress. And then the DAO act is sent by the ingress to the root. So imagine if you wanted to have two paths in the same message, that would be two acts from two different egresses that would have to be generated. How, what happens if half of that works and the other half doesn't work? So it really led to, to, to huge complication. So the game here is to say, let's do simple. So we can have multiple targets, why? Because these are the, the targets are who you can reach over this track and to simplify think of a track as a tunnel just for a minute and it's really uh it's really like an aware leaves when you look at each time we have to tunnel or we don't have to tunnels you don't know it's exactly the same game so so think about this game and for a minute just think that we tunnel all the time remember in user free point we don't tunnel exactly all the time but almost all of the time and and see uh the children and the uh uh, siblings of uh, the egress of the tunnel as, as if they were unaware leaves. So, I get in a track, you're encapsulated, for instance, to add the, the source route of a, a, a non storing PDAO. So, so you're encapsulated between the ingress and the egress, and the inside packet goes to a sibling, for instance, of, of the egress. So you have to signal all those siblings that you can reach over the tunnel. And you have to see now the hops of the tunnel. And you have to give a name to this tunnel. OK. Um, so what we, we decided already is that the name of the tunnel is, is the track ID. Uh, it's the local instance ID taken from the namespace of uh, the egress. OK, so we have, we have this first information that we have to store somewhere. The, the egress and the local instance ID associated to that egress, which together identify the tunnel, identify the track. Okay, that's one thing we need to signal in this PDAO. Second thing we want to signal in the PDAO is all those siblings and children of the egress that we can reach over this tunnel. But like we said, there must be one other way, at least when we are doing a uh, story mode. Uh, even in non storing but it's, it's a bit more weird. Um, so, so we need to, to signal all the siblings. And then we need to signal the hops, either that ends up as a source route or that ends up as a, as a state in all the hops to, to go in that direction. We needed to signal this, this sequence of hops. So the question was, the question was, how do we do that? And we tried and we discussed with Raoul, etc. And we ended up with what I'm going to show very soon, which is that we signal the track identification in the DAO. And that's very normal because in the DAO, in the, DAO, in the, 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 the main control message, um, the base object, you, you have a DODAG ID and you have an instance ID. That's already there in the DAO. So the PDAO is a DAO, just like the others. But if it's signaling a track, then the geodag ID is the egress, and the local the instance ID is a local instance ID uh, that identifies the track. So that that was a very very uh, logical mapping um, because we are building a geodag, and uh, it's rooted at the at the egress of the track. So it's completely normal that we signal those things in the DAO message itself. Okay, now. 
could we have multiple targets? Yes, we could. Okay, so because there are all the siblings, so it's not hard to, to signal the target. So we allow multiple target options. So we call them RTO, ripple target option, uh, the credit, but that, the, the target. Okay, what becomes of the TIO, which is the transit? Well, remember the transit was just giving you a hop, the parent. But here we are giving a sequence of hops. So TIO could not be used. We have invented the VIO instead. What is a VIO? You can see it as a generalization of the TIO, but with multiple hops in them. So we end up with the same, the PDAO is really much like a DAO. You've got the, the DAO based object, just that the track is indicated in there as opposed to the main DODAC. Then you have a number of target options, just like in normal DAO. And then you've got a VIO or a source route VIO, which is this VI information option that replaces the TIO. And that instead of having just one parrot, it has multiple halves. So it's kind of logical. The, the one thing that we, we made as a simplification is to say, hey, we have only one. VIO. And there were a number of reasons for that, but just think about the flow in storing mode where the acknowledgement has to come from the ingress. If you have multiple ingress, who sends the acknowledgement? How does that work? What, what kind of failures should you have to handle? So we said, hey, much simpler. We can have multiple targets, but we just have one VIO. Also, at some point in the past, the source, uh, the storing mode VIO. So the normal VIO, you would basically have one options option per hop. So it was a collection of options indicating uh, something serial, but that would consume a lot of bytes. It's actually easier to, to put them all in a single VIO with a list. So that's a change that, that I made in the draft and that enables a better compression with RFC 8138. So that's one of the decisions we made. Now we can compress the VIO with RFC 8138. Can you please go to the next slide, please? So you see, we made we made a, a, a number of, of simplification. Now, we also made a number of changes that we discussed on the mailing list. First one being to compress the PDAO, because when you have a list of a full IPv6 ad address, that's that's actually consuming a lot of signaling that has to go from the root to the, to the path. The other reason is if RFC 8138 is enabled in the network, then it's very, very cool that the source route header in the compressed form that has to be added by the ingress to do the encapsulation is already completely built by the root. Remember in, in normal operation, only the root builds those uh, source routing header in compressed fashion. Because the source routing header always starts at the root in normal operation. And 8138 enables a, a very uh, efficient compression, but it's, it's, it's more code, it's harder to do. So being able to provide in the PDAO, the source route header exactly in the way that it would be put in the packet, was a huge simplification for the devices themselves. They just have to pick it from the PDAO, put it in the packet, and there you go. So we wanted to enable that format. And so 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 that was done in the in the recent uh, publication. Like I like I said earlier, the, the Ripple instance ID, the local Ripple, uh, Ripple instance ID is the track ID. So that's consistent with like I said, six dish and, and row. So all those drafts all those works are expected to be done that way. What is a bit harder is if, if it's a local instance ID, it's always associated to an IPv6 address because the IPv6 address is the namespace for which this local instance ID is taken. So you, you always need to have both in the packet. So in Ripple, uh, that was already specified like this. You need to say if the source of the, of the packet or the destination of the packet is the space. And so there is a bit in the local instance ID in the RPI to, to tell you if the namespace associated to that local instance ID is the source of the packet or the destination of the packet. In the case of a track, the track is directional. It's always going towards the egress. So the namespace is always the destination of the packet. 
And there is, so, so the flag that indicates source or destination is always on, it means destination. So basically in this draft, we say, hey, when you, you write a track ID, you have to have the, the bit always set. So there are not two versions of track ID, the one that would just not specify the bit and the one which has the bit set, which goes in the packet. So let's always set the bit. So there is text now to say that. The, 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 complex, the complication that goes with that is uh, when you have a packet and you use the, the uh, non-storing mode, so you use uh, the routing header, the actual destination of the packet is at the end of the routing header. <laughs> it's not the destination in the IPv6 header itself because you have to consume all the routing headers until and when all everything is consumed, then it's actually in the IPv6 header. Otherwise, it's the routing header. So it's kind of hard in the normal IPv6 format to find who is the final destination. You have to look at whether the routing header is consumed or not. If it's not consumed, then it's the last half, the, the last entry of the routing header. If the routing header is consumed, then it's the destination in the IP. Well, so I had to write text to explain that. So I did. Um, but if you're using 8138, 8138 made it so that uh, we actually encode the destination in the IP header as the first entry in the routing header. So everything is in the routing header. And that, that also makes it so that the last entry in the, in the routing header is always the final destination. There is never a question. So 8138 is really meant to make the forwarding much simpler. Well, that also makes this particular operation of identifying the namespace of the track ID uh, a lot easier. So if we have 8138, it's easy. If we don't have 8138, you have to look at whether the routing header is present, if it's present, whether it's consumed, and blah, blah, blah. Okay. One addition we made recently, <coughs> but I, I kept it on this slide, but is that we have added this sibling information. So <coughs> in, in, in addition to the normal DAO signaling from non-storing mode, the sibling information gives the root all the topological information that it needs to build the tracks. Now, what is not done in the draft, and I don't think we should do it, but if you tell me do it, we'll do it. It's that we don't say which sibling a node should advertise. Because in a very dense network, you may have hundreds of nodes around you that you could signal. That would be a lot to signal to the root. So, so you may have to decide which siblings are useful and should be signaled to the root and which ones should be ignored. For instance, because they don't give, if in that direction, you have enough siblings to, to progress, you don't need more siblings in that direction to go to, to somewhere. And I don't know that. So, so the reason why you should signal siblings and which siblings you should signal in this sibling option, we don't have text for that. We don't explain it's out of scope. Sibling selection is something else. So if you have very few siblings, uh, an implementation can just signal everything and, and you're, we are happy. If we have a dead situation, there will have to be some intelligence to decide which siblings to, to signal, and that may depend on the use case. It's out of scope. Next slide, please. And, and Ines, you interrupt me if you think I'm taking too much time, because I, like I said in the bashing, I need more time than 15, but when you think that you need the rest of the time, just cut me. Okay, um, thank you. So we had that, that requirement on the mailing list, and I heard it again recently from another source. Uh, it's useful to be able to ask for a PDAO from within the network. An example of that is uh, if you look at the TSN architecture, so, uh, and I don't have a drawing for that, so you have to bear with me. There are three modes in the TSN architecture. The first mode is you have an application controller talking to, to the network controller, and the application controller tells network controller, build this path. So there is no interaction between the, the, uh, the node that generates the packet and, and the, the deterministic tunnel, if you like. It's all happening between the controllers. 
So the, the, the node may talk to its controller, say I need this path. Um, the application controller talks to the network controller, say I need this path. The application controller talks to the network devices, so that's the PDAOs, to build the path. And when the, the path is built, you know, the, 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 the acknowledgement goes back to the PDAO app, goes to the root, and the root talks to the PC, which is the network controller, and says, I'm happy. The network controller goes to the application controller, say, I'm happy. And, and that goes back to the, the, the node which needs it that can start the traffic. So there is no interaction between the, the, the device and the network. There is no UNI. The second model is completely the opposite. It's completely distributed. It's when something like RSVP happens in the network and there is no control at all. So it's a model that's possible, but it's not one that we support with DeathNet or RTSM really now. We, we go for, to controller based, at least for the network. Now there is an hybrid model where you have a UNI, user to network interface between the device and the first operator. Something like what we do with Rural, for instance, with 8505. So you, you have like an ND abstraction um, between the host and the network. And then the network goes to the root and say, oh, we have this request to build this track. So it's really a request coming from a router in the network, which says, I need to build a track to that destination. And so with just PDO, we did not have the signaling for saying this. So we added this PDAO request message and this PDAO acknowledgement message, uh, this PDR acknowledgement message, which basically enable a router to go to any router in the repo domain, to, in the DODAC, to go to its root and say, I need a destination to this particular target. And the goal is that from there, the root that PDAO creates the track, can be a multi segment track, can be a complex track comes back and say, I built it. And then over the UNI, the, the first router can go and, and tell the guy, hey, yes, now the track is ready. You can start sending these packets. Um, one remark is inside this, this PDR and in the PDR acknowledgement, you have the track ID that is present. So it's the same locally significant uh, instance ID for for the egress of the track. When the requester makes the request for the first time, he does not even know who the egress is. He just knows the target. So he would put zeros to, to signify, to indicate the, the, the egress and to indicate the, the instance ID. For, so everything that identifies the track. But there will be a time where the lifetime that was requested for this track is exhausted and when he will need to know. So in the first request, it's all zero, the PDRAC comes back if it's a status zero, uh, saying okay, it will come back with the egress uh, IPv6 address and the local instance ID. So everything to identify the track. And then if the, the ingress needs to continue and maintain that track beyond the lifetime, then it will, uh, it will use that information to renew basically. So it's not a big surprise. The, the thing that's more interesting is that the uh, the PDAO and the lifetime of the segments in the PDAO is completely separate from the lifetime of the track. Meaning that, um, say it's a, a simple tunnel multi hop segment, just one segment, source to destination, and that's the track, a serial track. So say you're building that, you may say, so the, the PDR may say, I want it for an hour. And that's the track lifetime in the, P, the, the, the PDR, the PDAO request. Well, the root may send a PDAO of 10 minutes, and after 10 minutes, a new one, after 10 minutes, a new one, and maintain that a completely different time scale as the track. Does, so, so the PDAO lifetime, so the segment lifetime in the PDAO doesn't have to be the segment, the, the track lifetime at all. They're completely decoupled. The PDR is a contract between the requester, so the ingress of the track, and the route to get the track for a duration. How the track ma is managed by the route is orthogonal. The, the, the timelines don't have to be aligned. 
So, so there is a lifetime in, in the PDAO, there is a lifetime in the PDR. They are not the same. Uh, tac, tac, tac. So as we said, the mailing list will align the, 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 the wording for track. And I have uh, issues that are tickets that are raised for the security section. I, I know I still have to handle them, but right now we are handling the main operation. When we know what the main operation is, we can look at the security issues with them. But, um, yeah, so I, I did not do improvements in the security section right now. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, this illustrates what I just discussed earlier. So what you look at, if instead of track ID, you have instance ID, and if instead of uh, IPv6 address of the track egress, you have DODAG ID, guess what? It's exactly the DAO as in RFC 6550. So we're just saying, hey, a PDAO is a DAO, same format, same information. The IPv6 of the address of the track egress is the DODAG ID of the track. And the track ID is actually a local instance ID, so it's an instance ID, it's conforming. Next slide, please. Yes. Okay, so this draft introduced the VIO and the SRVIO as uh, with a generic name of route projection option which replaced the TIO basically when instead of having just one parent, you have this multi hop path to get to the target. So here is the format of the VIO. It has evolved many times. So they, here is the latest. So what we basically said is this VIO is a segment within the track. We also said that the track identification is not in the VIO because it's in the DAO that we just saw in the previous slide. So we don't have to identify the track, we just have to identify the segment. The segment can be the full track if it's a serial A, B, C, D, but it can be just one, uh, I would say, uh, edge in, in a graph uh, to, to get there if the track is a complex uh, track. So what we need is a segment ID because it will be refreshed individually. So each segment of the track has a PDAO separate and it's refreshed separately. So it has its own ID. Uh, one segment may be killed and replaced by another segment. And the rest of the track could stay the same. So they are completely managed individually. They have a sequence in the lifetime like everything repo. So this is not very surprising. Um, so it's the same kind of uh, uh, sequence as we had in uh, in the TIO. And then what you see is an SRH six layer RH header because we enabled 8138 compression. Now, if, if you don't want the via addresses, the, the hops, to be compressed at all, well, six layer RH has a format for that. You just use a, a type four. And that's basically the full address. But then if you use another type, um, they're gonna be compressed. In the case where you have 8138 enabled in the network and you're using non-storing mode, so you, you, you put a routing header in the packets, you encapsulate with a routing header. What we want is what you see here, as I said earlier, to be exactly what goes in the packet. It might be that you need more than one SRH, six layer H, if the size of the compression changes along the path. So in that case, you need to have multiple actually SRH, six layer H in there. I just show one, but it could have to be repeated in, the, in that particular case. So imagine that after the via address N, you can have another SRH, six layer H header, more addresses and another SRH, six layer H header and more addresses could be in the case where 8138 is enabled in the network and uh, we are using bond storing PDAO. Next slide. Okay, so that's a, a reminder of uh, Ripple because Ripple is already like that. When you have a packet that, that flows in the network, the final destination of the IPv6 header or the source 
is the namespace for a local repo uh, instance. The instance itself is signaled in the RPI, and it has basically, if it's a, if it's a local instance, you have one bit which says local, so the first bit has to be set, then one bit which says source or destination, and when, like I said earlier, when it is set, it indicates that the namespace is the destination. And then left are six bits for the local instance ID. That's why you can have at most 64 local instances, so 64 tracks that terminates at the same ingress. But for each node in the network, you can have 64 tracks that terminates in this node. So that gives us quite a bit of, of signal in space. Next slide. So here is the, the look and feel of the new sibling information. The, I had a question uh, about step of rank. I think I did it, but I, I forgot. Yes, somebody wants to speak? Okay, so basically you have the address of the sibling and, and the cost from uh, the, the node to the sibling is expressed as a step of work. That's pretty much it. Next slide. So here is the PDR. Uh, don't be surprised, there is a lifetime, which is the, the duration for which the uh, track should be built. And uh, if we want to make it longer, we have to send a new PDR with the track ID that we get the first time. So the first time the track ID is uh, set to zero, Next slide. And here is the PDR hack. Uh, what doesn't show here is uh, in both cases, we need the, the track egress. So it should be present all the time. So I need to add it. Next slide. And here are the padding issues and we're getting close to, to the end of this presentation. So the, the first big, uh, pending issue is how do we do do we have to to place the egress of the track in the sequence of hops in the VIO? Remember the egress is already signaled in the PDAO base object. On the other hand, if you want to use 813 compression and you want the root to build the full header, then you would like to put the, the the egress in there because it's the last hop, it's present in the header. Um, there are other reasons as well uh, for which you, you would like to, to, to place the egress in the sequence. For instance, if you're uh, changing the main instance as opposed to building a track, in the case of the main instance, you need to know the last hop because the, the, the diodag ID is the main diodag ID. So the, the you don't have to signal a diodag ID because it's it's a global instance. There is no diodag, there is no there is no namespace associated to it. It's just a global namespace. So if we don't place the diodag ID in the uh, DAO, and so it has to be uh, indicated in the sequence. So overall, there are many cases where you want the egress to be uh, indicated in the VIO, but then it's kind of a duplication with the fact that in some cases it's also in the DAO. So, do we want the simplification that it might be duplicate information? Or do we want to have a lot of complexity saying, hey, uh, in some cases it's placed, in some cases it's not. If it's not, you have to, to put it yourself because at the end it has to be there. So, uh, then that's really a question to the group and to you guys. I mean, do you want to aim for simplification in this case? The cost being that we might, in some cases, duplicate the egress node one in the DAO and second as the last entry in the SRVIO in the compressed form. It's okay to do that, or do we have to go through the complexity? I'm not sharing anything. From my side, uh, Pascal, and I, I'm still not sure as in why the 
why the last uh, the egress uh, address should be for, uh, present as the last element in SRVI. You know, so I, oh, let me explain that again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first case is you're in the main instance, right? Mm -hmm. So in the main instance, you don't signal the DODAG ID in the DAO because that would be the root anyway. Right. Right. Okay. So even if you signal it, it's the wrong thing. Actually, the draft has published says two different things at two different places. And both are wrong. You, you should not have anything there. Because the Diodag ID is, is the main. And if you start signaling the track egress there, then it, it looks like a mess because it's not the Diodag ID of, of that instance. So it's, 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 it looks weird to, to, to try to signal the track egress in the Diodag field of a PDAO for the main instance. That looks weird. If you don't do it there, the only place where you have it is the last entry of the segment in the VIO, the last yes, in the VIO that expresses the segment. In that case, you must visit it. Now, the other case is, um, so you have 8138 uh, deployed, right? So you're running the compression. And as I said earlier, I made every effort so that the, the SRVIO, which has the source route, header built by the root is built exactly like you would like to see it in the packet. So the node just has to pick it up there, put it in the encapsulation after the IP and IP. Just go, go for it. Don't have to do complex computation of doing the compression himself, right? The compression is done by the root. But the format that you have has to include the, the egress. You, you have to, to remember the way it one trade works, but each okay. each entry in the routing header depends on the previous entry. You build on the previous entry oh, and you okay. just express okay. the change. Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically the node would have to understand exactly the compression that took place all the way to the previous up, to the previous teammate up before to know how he can express the egress as an addition to that. So that makes his life complicated. So that's okay. the second uh, big so, reason. So, uh, so Pascal, now I think I get a hang, but I think I'll have to revisit 8138 again to understand that point more clearly as to, uh, what you're saying is that the compression depends on, uh, the, the, the uncompression depends on having that last element present. Yes, right? it's, it's a bit like co-op when you, you build the next option number as a delta to the previous. So it's kind of like that. If you know the previous address, and, and the routing header will tell you how many bytes uh, differ, and you just override those bytes. Now, okay. if, for instance, the, um, the 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 egress differs by only two bytes from the penultimate hope, then you need a, a, a six row SRH which which expresses two bytes. Now, say for some reason that the previous node as a 6 to SRH uh, that uses four bytes, then you need to insert an additional 6 to SRH just to say, oh, no. Bytes. On the other hand, if it was already two bytes, then you can just put one more address in there. So, so just doing the complication, the computation of how to add something basically brings you to have to understand all the complexity of how you encode uh, a 6 to SRH in the first place, which is complex. And, and right now in repo, the nodes don't have to do that. They have to be able to read them, but they don't have to be able to write them. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to keep that simplicity where the node, even if they are the ingress now of a track, where they have to do this encapsulation and place the routing header, um, they just have to copy, memory copy, mem copy from here. You know, just exactly those bytes, bang, you're done. And those bytes being built by the root. So, so we don't have to look at one implementation which doesn't know how to build it correctly. It's always the root. Okay. Uh, Pascal, another question I have is in context to the siblings uh, information. So uh, in one case, in one, at one point you mentioned that, uh, you know, let's keep the calculation of, you know, the quality of link to the sibling. That calculation is an OF type calculation and we'll keep it outside the scope of uh, of this document uh, but at the mm -hmm. same time uh, we are introducing the sibling options uh, 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 the new option to specify all the siblings for this uh, for this node can we so go back please to the 
uh, Raoul, I'm sorry, just so that, yeah. yes, exactly. Uh, back to the seedling option, please. In the... Yeah, yeah here. there we go. Yep. Uh, yeah, so here, uh, so one thing that you mentioned uh, in, in, in during your presentation is that the calculation, uh, the, the quality of link from the node, from the egress node to its sibling is an OF type calculation and it's clearly out of scope for this document. Uh, but in this, so, so then why do we want to add uh, the sibling information option at all in this document if that is, if that is out of scope for, you know, that okay. calculation? So, so we have to discuss that on the mailing list, right, Raoul? Sure. But the, the short okay. answer with, with the current draft is we don't know how the step of rank is computed, but it's present. So the OF is there, right? There might be a different OF for building the track, but then, you know, I don't know. But at least the step of rank uh, for the current OF between this node and the sibling is expressed in here as a step of rank. Now, this is computed with the main DODAG OF. We also have a, a metric option, which can be uh, placed with the sibling option, the, the classical ripple metric option. Okay. If we do that, then we don't even know what the objective function is at the PCE that computes the track. We just know the result of the track. And that, that includes, uh, he has chosen an egress which was near the sibling for a particular OS of, uh, of his. And the nearness of the selected egress to the sibling would be known because each potential egress sent a sibling information with the metric option in there. So like Ripple does, you can put all the metrics, like I read this LQI, I read this, whatever. I don't know what you're gonna do with that. That's the PC computation, but at least he has the base information for doing this computation. I, I, I'll just like to bring to the notice that, you know, the same type of information is required you know, we, we discussed uh, that even the NSA extension requires uh, a similar type of information uh, uh, to be sent. Uh, so, so that is sort of an open item for this working group. Uh, you know, we, we so, so, yeah. The, okay, the, the, we, we, if you don't mind, Raoul, let's explain that yes, on the mailing yes. list yeah. um, and, and explain what the premise is and what the relationship with NSA sure. is, et cetera, et cetera. But the short answer for this draft is, we provide the step of rank for the main OF. So if we're talking about doing something which is uh, as the same objective as the main OF, then use step of rank. If the root uses the computation, which is uh, more specific, then we can always, for each sibling relationship, pass the metric information that we already have in normal DAO. So everybody could pass metric information. And the, the whichever OF the PC decides to run as long as the metrics are present in this metric information, it can run. And we don't have to know what it does. It's completely internal to the PC. And, and then it comes back with a track. And that's magic, but we don't have to know. So that's basically where we are with this draft. Okay. Uh, next slide, can you, can you go back? I think I'm pretty much done, but is there something else? Yeah, that's the missing feature. It's a traditional list of uh, security consideration that I said I did not do. The next step, uh, the work group last call around next ITF is certainly not a good idea. We are not there yet. Uh, but maybe the one after, if, if the group you know, helps. So I, I, I provided a, a number of news. I would like to, to assess if what I presented today people agree with because there are recent changes which were made or are being made. But if there is something which is wrong, for instance, in the selected simplifications, or if you guys want more simplification, um, then yes, feedback on the mailing list, please. And so I have, uh, you know, I keep reading it, but like everything you write when you read it after you miss the bugs. Uh, there, are, there are still a number of bugs, including the DODAG ID of the main DODAG, which it should not be there. And, and there is things which appear several times and not necessarily consistent. I need to fix. 
so, so there is some some editorial work, but I have the feeling that we are converging on on the main operation. So, so that that's my feeling with this draft. We, we kind of we are getting there. Uh, need cleanup, need simplification. If you can have ideas of more simplification, need some text messaging to remove duplication, remove some bugs. Getting there. That's that's pretty much how I feel about it. And that, that's it, I guess, this time. Okay, uh, so let me begin. Uh, in a okay. Uh, All right. Thank you very much, uh, for your information. Uh, do you are aware of some implementation of things? Uh, I, we, we are starting to implement it. I think that's a prototype. But you know the the, the the draft is still in flux, uh, so obviously we don't have a final implementation of the draft, which is not final. But uh, yes, uh, on our side we, we are we are beginning an implementation. I would say we have one person assigned, and uh, you know when can he goes and do some code. But you've seen the draft, right? I mean, I published like three versions, three upgrades. We've had a number of, of discussion on the mailing list. Each time, you know, the formats change and blah, and the restrictions change. So, it's not like we are doing a product tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much, Pascal. More questions? Okay, Raul, please. Okay, uh, I'll just, uh, I, I'll, uh, the capabilities draft, it has, uh, so can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, we had uh, we had uh, got received feedback from Dominic on the GitHub uh, 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 repo, and we have uh, made changes. Uh, so uh, let me just clarify here that there were no changes which impacted the basic uh, you know uh, structuring of any of the options or any. There was no major design change as such in the in the document. But thank you, Dominic. You know uh, we we have received an elaborate uh, review of the complete document. Uh, yeah, the changes are already pushed in. Another aspect is uh, Ines listed uh, some of the open items uh, during the beginning of this meeting. Uh, those open items are already taken care of, uh, especially in context to the capabilities draft. In context to the observations draft, those some of the uh, 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 some of the items are open. So let me let me just uh, uh, you know uh, summarize what the document contains currently. It contains uh, the capability options that can be carried as part of our Ripple messages. Uh, how do you advertise uh, the capabilities? So it's a new type, it's a new control option. Then we need some instant, we needed some instantiations of existing capabilities. Uh, so so we have two two types of capabilities right now. There, the one is the capability indicator flags. Uh, for any capability, we just can be signaled using a simple flag. And then there are uh, you know more uh, verbose capabilities which requires some sort of additional information to be sent. So currently we have uh, the indicators flags and the resource routing resource capabilities. In the last version, we even had something called as neighbor uh, neighbor table uh, capability, you know, which which basically signaled the NCE, uh, the amount of information, the amount of entries that can be part of NCE. Uh, we have removed that because we didn't have any specific use case in mind right now. Yeah. Then the next thing that we have in the document is the query and response signaling. Uh, this was already discussed in the last entering, uh, in the last uh, ITF session, uh, and then the guidelines for defining new capabilities. The only must that we have in the document is that the cap handling of capabilities is, 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 is mandatorily required if the network uses MOPEX, uh, basically MOP greater than or equal to seven. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so these are the cap uh, capability options. So when there is one container option called as the capabilities option, uh, which contain which can contain multiple capability TLVs. There are two TLVs currently defined: the capability indicators and routing resource uh, routing resource uh, uh, TLVs. And then there is another option which is specifically used in context to query and response, which is the capability type list, which 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 will in Using that option, it is possible to enumerate all the capabilities that are supported by that particular node. Uh, so uh, these are the only three things that are that, that have been introduced by this by this uh, draft. 
Next uh, slide, please. This is the basic signaling that we have for query response. Uh, you know, there are some, some cases which, which has some detailed information as in if there is, uh, so, so the first, first diagram is about uh, querying the supported capability types. Like I mentioned in the previous slide, there is a capability type list option which can be responded with. It is also possible for a node to query for specific capabilities where the cap one and cap two is present. In the, in the second uh, diagram, you can see that the root is querying whether cap one and cap two is supported by the target node. Uh, uh, the, the, the node sends back the capability, uh, the corresponding capabilities with the corresponding values. Now it is possible that only the partial list is supported for the, the, the query is made for cap one and cap two, but only cap one is supported. So the draft has handling for that as well. And there are corresponding secure messages uh, for this query and response uh, messages as well, the cap Q and cap S message. Uh, so that's uh, next slide please so that's that's pretty much it you know uh, from the capability side we didn't had any major update uh, since and whatever work items uh, we env envisioned during before starting this work has been fulfilled uh, so i would like uh, you know uh, to see if there are any specific opinions as to how we can proceed with this draft you know for, 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 from from uh, from my side there are no further updates that that are pending can we get uh, can uh, can i make a request to this working group to get some reviews done i have a question if, if yes possible. yeah okay um well the question is not really to the draft itself mm -hmm. um and, and yes i hope you review uh how by the way um the question is more like uh we the for Ripple v2, so it's going to be just put it on the table now, but we, we, are, we have this Ripple v2 discussion. Shall we continue to maintain all the secured version of the options and all the, the, the support of security that was inside Ripple v1 that nobody ever implemented? As I know, I mean, maybe somebody did, but I'm not aware of any implementation of the secured version of Ripple. Um, as it goes, this and um, the, 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 the fan out control bits or the other bits in the configuration option, the Geoda configuration option that we may want to clear after map seven. The, the, the change that we, we do for use of Ripple Info says basically that the configuration flags uh, are not defined after map six. Because it renames the, the, the registry to say for map zero six. Meaning this 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 byte of flag is just does not exist in map seven. So that, that really reopens the question of supporting the security version. And so I would like before we, we you know because we do this this work for Ripple V2. And if somewhere else we decide that Ripple V2 doesn't have the secured option or, and doesn't have the fan out control, then this draft should not even worry about it. That's, that's what I need. Pascal, just one clarification. When you say the fan out, uh, you, you're talking about the path control bits. Is, is that correct? Uh, the path control bits? Uh... This is correct, so, Paul. The, the path okay. control bits are managing how many copies of a DAO can flow over the reverse the right, route. Yeah. So that's what that's the fan out how much you know okay it's okay. it spreads. <laughs> okay. Yeah so uh, that's uh, so the, but one thing is if we if if we decide to not uh, uh, have a secure message for any of the existing message then it basically means that the secure RPL will be broken. So if that is okay for the working group, you know, yeah, we don't have any implementation yet. It's more like when we specify what Ripple V2 is, mm -hmm. will we okay. specify okay. Ripple V2 with every feature of Ripple V1 or will, shall we drop the features that nobody ever cared for? Okay. And this security- So, so but I think, I think the immediate question is whether or not this 
cap Q cap S needs a secure value, a secure version, I think is what the question was. Uh, points to that, right? I mean, do we need to, to keep adding secured version of everything we do uh, for Ripple V2? So Michael, I, I don't believe the question was in context to capabilities per se, because in my, yeah. you know, we, we haven't envisioned using CapQ and Cap as insecure messages myself, but. Uh, well, I, I, I agree. So I think the point was, you know, do we just define any new message as also having a secure version um, <laughs> is the point. Um, is that because the, the registry is not arranged that way? It actually is arranged. You could actually create secure messages that don't have unsecure ones and vice versa. The registry isn't say it's just this bit. It doesn't say there's this upper bit and then a seven bit value. It says there's there's uh, 256 things, some of which are secure and some of which aren't. So uh, we could not bother defining it in a secure form because of the reasons Pascal gave that we're probably going to rip them out. Um, okay. Uh, I, I, I'm, I would be fine with that. Um, it's unfortunate that no one is, no one has found a business case for the secure version of ripple. Um, but that's it as it is. Uh, okay. But, uh, from the maintenance side, it's not a big, big change, uh, to keeping the secure version of the corresponding messages in a way. The it's high order bed, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not the a high big order, deal. it's just an entry, yeah, 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 sorry. So, so another thing that you mentioned, Michael, was uh, you know, we don't have a mandate, the RPL doesn't mandate that you know, for every message, you need to have a corresponding secure message, but but in a way, the way message, uh, uh the, the message type is uh, decided, uh, for example, it's 0x01 for DIO, it's assumed that 0x81 is for. Uh, security io uh, so that one to one mapping is in in some way it is there you know we might want to yeah okay we, we get alvaros and yes we need to bring that to the main and yes okay. we'll start discussing it okay. like, right, okay. right after but yes certainly yes yeah, yeah sure okay uh, let me go on to the other slides uh, i just have a couple of more slides uh, to talk about and again uh, yeah. Ines, can we please go to the next slide? Uh, the MOPEX updates. So MOPEX, the primary update has been extending. So so there is uh, earlier the draft only talked about extending, adding, adding a MOPEX option. Basically, the base MOP, if it is seven, how would the extended option looks like? Uh, the new MOPEX option looks like. But in the last version, we added uh, something called as extending uh, RPL control options in a way in which it could be backward compatible, uh, the new options that we keep adding. And we are adding new control options at a very great you know, pace, uh, even in the DAO projection, even in the capabilities options. We want to make sure that we have a good system, especially if anyone decides to add a new control option to, have, to keep it backward compatible in a, in, in a proper way. So this particular uh, actual control options, uh, make sure that you know, we can have backward compatible uh, uh, RPL option format. Uh, that's that, that that's it. Uh, you know the the only problem the the one problem in the last version was that the location of X bit was uh, assumed to be second most MSB. Uh, the assumption was that the first bit was used for secure control option, but there's no such thing as secure control option. Uh, so we moved the MSB uh, to the first. Uh, you know, the, we now started making use of the X bit as the first uh, MSB. The INS section is updated to reflect all these uh, changes uh, uh, because, because this uh, this is an update to RFC 6550. Uh, yeah, that's what, that, that's it. Uh, I guess. Uh, can you please go to the next slide, uh, Ines? Yeah. Thank you very much, Raul. Uh, yeah, we will request a comment for both of these documents. And so from a uh, Ripple version two topics, we need to prepare the contents. Mm, but yeah, I think we, before go into deep like that, we need to uh, solve the projection issues, um, uh, capability and MOPEX as well. So um, how to 
think that we will proceed, we need to prepare the table of content and put topics and then figure out as well what about the secure messages version. So, um, do you want, uh, do you have some comments on that? We, we have already the tablet for content in GitHub, so you can update it. But I think as well it's important to solve the current uh, draft that the working group has. Like, well, now we are having aligned the use of Repel Info and our leave, uh, compression, turn on. Um, but as well, uh, we need to figure out as well what to do with the uh, surfers like the projections and the rest that we have as uh, related documents. And at the same time, we can work in the table of content at the five, uh, which section of the RFC 6550 uh, are going to be modified, extended, or deleted from this version. Do you have some additional comments on it? Probably, um, okay, probably it's going to be as well uh, this topic, uh, the main topic for the ITF 109. There is, there is realizing via your information. Yes. Okay. Sorry? Ah, yes. Um, yes. Yes, please proceed. Oh, yeah. So, so basically, w one thing here from this list is that PDAO and AODV repo are kind of uh, things we do for Ripple V1 as well, right? They are, kind of, they, 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 they are defined in the Ripple V1 world and would be ported in the Ripple V2 world. But the question I had on secured options applies to PDAO as well because we have this, uh, the, the, the PDR, the PDR hack probably will uh, require a secured version. And yes. Unless, unless the group tells me, you know, not to write them, I will have to take my pen and, and emulate what to do for secure option, even if I know the body will ever implement it, which is kind of a pain. I just did not want how to go through that same pain if we decide that for Ripple V2, we don't do that. Right? That's, that's kind of what the back of my mind when I, I discuss that. So, yes. Uh, so, PDAO, PDAO and, and, and LGV repo could could need some porting here, but they are yeah. yes, they are repo v1 functions. Map mapex etc. They are pure repo v2 functions. So that, yeah. That's how it looks strange on the same list. As well, they are. Uh, I don't remember which exactly which part, but in 6550 there are some kind of sections that say this is for future work, this part is for future work, and this is for future work. So uh, we. We will have to check which kind of this future work that 6550 was mentioned can be applied here now. I don't recall exactly which sections, but uh, I will check that. Um, as well, I think we have to do like a priority list. What issues have to be solved before we can proceed with that? But I mean, uh, nothing, uh, nothing, uh, avoid to work in the table of content and update the GitHub with the topics or make a draft on that. Uh, what uh, you feel more comfortable, but I think we need to the priority list to issue solve to start working on that. What do you think? Certainly. So my message was for your list. Maybe split it in like new functions. That that's things like uh, mopex etc. Or uh, um, elide via your information. There are uh, functions which are ported from, from V1, and that includes PDAO, repo, IODV repo, and functions that we keep from Ripple V1 when we go through the document. And there are probably the missing extensions or, or the refinement of V1, where we said, um, like you said, this is for future, or we said, we don't know exactly how this is done, so we leave it to implementations and, and maybe somebody will define that in the future as part of repo. So there are things like, how do you know your neighbors? You know, we say, oh, it could be NDE, blah. Um, so, so some things are not really fine. The use of stretch, things like that. So, so a better definition of things which were left 
the bit to implementation in Ripple V1. That would be the third category, and that includes what you said, like left for the future. Yeah, and as well, we, yeah, as well, we have to identify um, how I'd say um, which part of the sixty-five fifty get obsolete with this new version, and put it yes, yes. like, please pay attention that these kind of things are obsolete. This kind of thing, and uh, why the reason why? Uh, because we get this improvement, and so yeah. We can start working on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, additional comments? Um, what do you think is the way of working? The GitHub is OK for you? Uh, start putting there, or a draft? That yeah, I, I don't know if it's an official policy uh, in us, but it looks like it is almost official. Is every work of document should be in the world GitHub. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, the same. So, yeah. So action points like identify from 6550, which uh, sections are uh, are specified as a future work and just add it to the list, and then uh, set the priority issue that has to be solved before we can proceed with this RPL2 version 2 topics. So do you agree with these action points? Or how? Mm -hmm. OK, great. Thank you. Can, can you state the action point again? So I can uh, sorry. Okay. I don't know. Yes. Uh, the action will be like uh, going through 6550 and identify the sections that state as a future work and then add into the list as well alongside with the priorities issues that have to be solved before we can proceed with this Ripple version 2 topics. Okay. And other section, the things that go as well obsolete, and the reason why will be obsolete. So this is, and the information is going to be tracked into the GitHub. There is already a repository for that. Please feel free to add um, more suggestions. Thank you. Additional comments on it? Okay, I uh, will uh, probably this, this meeting is recorded. So the, the ITF secretariat is going to put it into YouTube and then I will share with you the link. So it's going to be useful to under, uh, to follow the, the person that could not attend about the new modifications in DAO projections and the contribution capabilities as well. So some additional <coughs> comments or suggestions. We probably we will request a meeting for uh, ITF 109. So please, uh, if you want to uh, present something, we will have time there as well. <coughs> so okay, we have we, yes. have we have time for any other business or any further discussion. Yes. <coughs> Is there any OAB? AOB. Okay, so if we don't have none. none, so I will start the recording now. It's fine. Okay, stopping the recording.